Thank you so much for that song. That is a beautiful reflection on the work that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. If you would, go with me to the book of 1 Peter, where we read, and that is going to be our passage for this morning. We are going to take a few, the next few minutes of the service to look at living hope and unspeakable joy. Those are really the two things that stand out in this passage. The fact that through Jesus, we have a living hope, and because of that, we can experience right now unspeakable joy. Now, I do want to ask this, and you don't have to raise your hands, you don't have to uh, wave or nudge somebody, but is anybody here a little bit weary this morning? Ah, uh-huh, yes, yes. <laughs> we all just chuckle a little bit because it's like, good night. Yes, it's been a week, and we come into church, and it's, okay, we want to be excited to worship and to praise God and to, to see one another. But there is a, sometimes in our lives, just a spirit of heaviness is kind of how the, is how the Bible describes it in this passage. But the amazing thing is that our lives do not have to remain in heaviness. We will face heaviness. The Bible does not deny that reality, but it points us to something greater than that. You know, because there's times when, you know, it feels like the things are hopeless, you know, life is hopeless, the world is hopeless, there's only darkness in the future. We look into the future and it's like, what do we look forward to? Well, maybe we can look forward to Christmas. But goodness, if if we find, if if, if the last year has taught us anything, things change rather quickly. Wasn't it just a few months ago that uh, we were having very low COVID numbers and it's like, hey, it seems like this thing is kind of dying out, but then boom, we're back at it, aren't we? Right? So over the next two months, I mean, hey, Christmas is coming, but um, good, Christmas is coming. <laughs> what is going to bring with it? You know what I'm saying? Uh, th- the thing is that Peter's audience very likely pr- felt like that as well. Because as we're going to see in, in, this, in this passage, and then if you study the rest of the book of 1 Peter, you'll find that he's speaking to a group of people that were going to face a fiery trial of affliction. They were not only facing the, the normal pressures of life and the pain and the heartache that, that is just common to life, right? There's things that are just common to man, but there are also extreme circumstances, And they were going to face some of those extreme circumstances. They were heading into Roman persecution. And this is something that we've not seen in in our life, perhaps even in our lifetimes in our country, persecution like these people were facing. And that's why this book was written, to encourage them, to exhort them, to, to point them to Jesus, because when everything else around them was falling apart, there's only one place that they could base their hope upon, and that was the living hope that's found in Jesus. And friends, that is the same lesson for us today. Because if we're going to base our hope on something other than Jesus Christ, the fact that he's risen, that he's given us an inheritance, that he loves us and no one can separate us from the love of Christ, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to find that 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 thing that you were depending upon for the stability of your soul is going to fail you. That's what it comes down to. And if we are to, uh, to thrive and to go forward following Jesus, if we are to avoid a cynical and hardened heart, we must turn to hope in Jesus Christ. And we must turn back time and time and time again because what happens? Days and months and years, they have a way of, of causing us to become cold, to be hardened, to become cynical, to become tired, to become weary. But the Bible tells us, no, turn back to Jesus. Look to him. Trust him because he's the one who will give you joy. That's what we find in these passages. We have a living hope found in Jesus, and it's good for the future, it's good for heaven, but it's also good for now. And that's one of the most important things I want to challenge you to consider as we study this, that the fact that we have an inheritance in Jesus doesn't just make the future good, but it can make the now good as well. So let's go into this passage. Let's allow God to teach us this morning. I hope that this is going to be a blessing to you. Here's the first thing. If you're taking notes, it's this. Very simple stuff, but very uh, basic, foundational. God gives you a living hope. That's where he starts off. He starts off this letter and says, God has given you a living hope. Now, I, want, I have a statement to make that's, that's very important when we study this letter. This letter 
The letter called 1 Peter was written to believers. It was written to Christians. And so when this point says God gives you a living hope, there's a, a asterisk, asterisk, if you will. If you're saved, you have this hope. But if you're here this morning and you've never believed in Jesus, you don't have this hope. And I don't know any other way to put it. That's the, the most clear way that I can give it to you. If you've not believed in Jesus alone for your salvation, you don't have hope, friend. The good thing is that you can have it this morning by believing in Jesus. Because the thing is, if you're coming here this morning and you're depending upon your goodness or the fact that you've been a member of Newton Baptist Church or the fact that you've been in church for a long time or you've, you've, you've done a lot of good things, that is not going to give you hope. Jesus alone can give you hope because you and I have sinned against God. And that's one of the things that it, this all centers around the gospel, that we've sinned against God and that God is the one who that had to provide a way of forgiveness. You can't undo the wrong that you've done. You need somebody who can take your sin and give you righteousness. And that's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. So if you're saved, you can, be, you can rejoice this morning because you have a living hope. And let's look at that as we start off. Verse number one, it starts off and says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. So he starts off very simply with who's writing and who's he writing to? Who's the writer? It's Peter. Peter was an apostle. He was a preacher. He was one of those disciples that walked with Jesus. He saw Jesus uh, during his ministry. He saw Jesus after he was risen. And look who he's writing to. Look how he defines them. There's some very interesting things in here. And, and this, the, 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 the fact that we have a living hope is evident in who we are. There's two words that I want you to, to, to notice. In verse number one, he says, to strangers scattered. Strangers scattered. Now that seems like a strange way to write a letter. Usually you say, dear brother so-and-so, dear sister so-and-so, dear Newton Baptist Church. But he doesn't say that because he's writing to some people that he very, he, he very carefully wants them to know who they are. He says, you're strangers. Now that doesn't mean they're weird, right? You might look around and say, hey, there's some people out here at Newton that they're strangers. They're a little bit weird, right? But that's not what he's saying. When you come across the word strangers in the Bible, you may be well aware of this, that that's talking about foreigners, people who don't belong in a place. That's what that word is. Uh, you'll find words like strangers, pilgrims, all of these different things refer to the fact that you and I as believers, we don't belong in this world. Right now, we are strangers in this world. And I believe that he, he wanted them to remember that because if they thought, hey, I am a Roman citizen, then that changes the way that they look at the world. If they thought, I am a resident of these places that he mentions, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, then that changes the way that they looked at the world. Because then what do they need to do? They need to say, look, I'm a Roman citizen. I have rights. The Roman government's gonna, uh, going to persecute me, so I need to fight back against that. But he says, no, 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 no. You're not a Roman citizen. You might live in Rome, but you know where you are a citizen of? You're a citizen of heaven. You belong to God. You're a child of God. You're an ambassador for Christ. So we need to start off with the right uh, perception of the world, that we don't belong here. And when we start to feel like, no, this is my home, we've missed it, friends, because this is not your home. Right now, you and I are strangers. We are pilgrims. We are traveling through this world to the place that God has prepared for us. And right now, we are scattered from that place. When it was scattered referred to uh, the, the diaspora or the, the Jews, they were Jewish people, but they were scattered to other places. And he applies that term to Christians saying, hey, you are the people of God. You're a believer. You're the people of God. You belong in heaven, but right now, you're scattered out. So I need to tell you some things because you're going to face some pain. You're going to face some heaviness. You're going to face some trials. And if you don't start with the right perspective, then you're going to start wrong. You're going to start with the wrong perspective and that's going to lead you the wrong way because if I belong here, if this is my home, then there is no hope. Man, 
take, take what we know about history. If those, if those believers were, were res, if they belonged to Rome, if they belonged in Rome, what hope did they have? No hope. Your only hope is that you're going to be killed for your faith in Christ. That's the only hope that they had. That's the only thing they could look forward to. Because hope in the Bible is more than, hey, I hope it won't rain today. Okay, that's, that's a different type of hope. Hope in the Bible is an expectation. What are we looking forward to? What are we anticipating that God has spoken to us? That is the hope that we find. And so it's, this hope is evident in who they are, that they are strangers who have been scattered. They belong to Christ. They've been saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. They don't belong to this world. Let's get another verse on this. John chapter number 15. Jesus spoke this. And I imagine Peter, as he's, he's writing to these believers, he is, is quoting things and, and bringing out things that Jesus told him that would be helpful to them. Because this book is just full of love and care and concern for these Christians. Look at what the verse says. It says, If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Jesus said, Hey, listen, <laughs> the world hates the light. Darkness hates light, and Jesus was the light that came into the world, and the darkness rejected him. So if, if the world rejected Jesus, they're probably going to reject you too. But that's okay, because I don't even belong here. I am on a mission here, and I'm going back to my Father. He has prepared a place for me. Look at verse number 19. If ye were of the world, or if you belonged to the world, the world would love his own. But because you're not of the world... But I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. Friends, we've got to start with the right perspective. We get worked up about things that maybe we shouldn't be worked up about because we start with the wrong perspective. I'm a citizen of heaven. If you're saved, so are you. And that is, should be the defining factor of our lives. That should be the foundation of our, of our perspective on life. So not only does, do we know that God has given us this living hope because of who we are, because we're strangers who are scattered, but it's given through the mercy of God that was shown in Jesus. This is the thing that's amazing. When you get down to verse number three, he says, Blessed be God the Father. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He says, listen, friends, we bless God. We praise God. Our God is worthy of praise. That's what it means that he is blessed, that he is worthy of trust. He is worthy of honor. He is worthy of praise. That's one of the reasons that we come together and we sing songs. We sing about how great our God is. We sing about what he's done because he is blessed because of who he is, because of what he's done. And what has he done for you? What has he done for you? Look at what it says. According to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The fact that God showed his mercy to you is, is known. We find out that God showed his mercy to us because he sent his son to die for us. And one of the things that we need to come to at this point is we need to look at this and say, okay, so what, is that, what does that do in me, right? What does this do for me? How does this change my life? Well, friends, it's easy. Like we talked about, I believe it was, yeah, Wednesday night. I'm getting my days mixed up. Wednesday night, we talked about rejoicing on purpose, uh, re remembering what God has done for us. If we would stop and consider the amazing mercy that God showed us, that would totally change the way that we look at things. That would change the way that we, we walk through life because what is the mercy of God that's shown to you? It's, it's, it means that he treats you a lot better than you deserve. And don't we get into trouble when we start thinking, hey, I deserve something. We get entitled. You know, it's kind of funny that we look at other people and say, man, they are so entitled. I can't believe, I, you know, we got all these things. I can't believe they feel like they're so entitled to things. Friends, do we have an entitlement mentality when it comes to the mercy of God, when it comes to the grace of God? If we got what we deserve, every single one of us would be on our way to hell. If we got what we deserved, you would have no Bible, you would have no church, you would have no preaching, you would have nothing from God. Because the only thing that we deserve, nothing, let me say, nothing good from God, because the only thing we deserve from God is judgment. 
because we have sinned against God. And there's a verse in the Bible that reminds me of the fact that when we forget how, how the, the, the nature of our sin, we don't love God like we ought. Jesus was speaking, I believe, if I'm, I'm, yeah, I hope I'm not misquoting this, the context where Jesus was speaking and he was talking to a Pharisee. And this Pharisee was, was looking at a woman that, that was expressing her love and care for Jesus. And he said, listen, those who have sinned little which is actually nobody because everybody has sinned a lot, right? But we think that we aren't that bad. Those that have sinned little, love little. But those that know and understand the, the nature and the gravity of their sin, they love Jesus a lot because they know that he's given us something that we don't deserve. Friends, we, we, get this, we get a wrong mentality about sin because maybe we're so far removed from what it is to be lost Right? We use those terms, lost and saved. What does it mean to be lost? It means that I've sinned against God, that I can do nothing to cleanse myself from sin. I can't overcome sin. I can't stop sin on my own. And sin is going to kill me. And sin brings shame. And sin, sin brings pain. Sin brings consequences. And before God, I have nothing but sin. There is no favor from God. That's what it means to be lost. I've sinned. I'm undone. I'm unworthy. I'm broken. I'm hopeless. And when we forget that we've sinned against God, we won't understand abundant mercy. We won't understand the amazing grace that we sing about. We sing about amazing grace in such a foolish way. Amazing grace. It's just a pretty song that we sing. No, it's not. It's, a, it's the reality of my life because if it was not for the grace of God, I would be lost. I would be forsaken. I would be broken. I would have no hope in this world. But because of his abundant mercy that he showed on us, that he expressed to us through Jesus. What did he do? He sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. He has made it so that we could be begotten again unto a lively hope, a living hope through the resurrection. The fact that Jesus rose means our hope is alive. Our expectation of, of eternity, of eternal life, of the best is yet to come, it's not based on somebody who's dead. It's based on somebody who's alive. That's what the resurrection does. It, 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 it shows us that our hope is alive and that nothing can do away with our hope. We get to the next verses. It's given to us through the mercy that's shown through Jesus and it's assured by the power, power of God. Our hope is assured by the power of God. Look at verse number four. I love this part and, and this is one of the things that's sort of an interesting Bible study note here is that all of verse number three four and five, that's all one sentence. That all goes together. And it's like one of these amazing things where it, 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 <laughs> it's like Peter is so excited that he just writes this run-on sentence. And he says, let, let me tell you about what God has done. And he's given us living hope. We can be born again. He's given us an inheritance. He keeps us. All of these things, he just stretches them out. And he wants us to grab a hold of this. And if we think that these Christians didn't know these things, it's probably, you know, they did, right? <laughs> like us, they knew a few things about Jesus. They knew a few things about God. But he writes to have, that they would know, the, it's, it's much like it's said in Ephesians, that they would know the height, the depth, the breadth, all of the things about the love of God that was shown to us. Look at verse number four. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. He says, listen, this inheritance, this eternal life, all of these things that we have from God that are promised us in Jesus Christ, because one of the things that's amazing about salvation is that it's not just a get out of hell free card. But when we are saved, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Jesus has prepared a place for us. He's gone ahead of us. He is interceding for us. The Holy Spirit does its work in our lives. He's given us the word of God. He is sanctifying us. There's a whole lot of things that come in this package called salvation. And one of the things that the Bible does is it, it, it unfolds that for us, saying, okay, listen, hey, you got saved. You realized that you were a sinner, that you needed Jesus to, to get into heaven. Praise God for that. But you know what else you got with it? You got an inheritance. 
And let me tell you about this inheritance. This inheritance, it's incorruptible. What does that mean? It, to be incorruptible. It refers to the fact that nothing can break it down. It can never perish. It can never ruin. Let me tell you about this inheritance. It's undefiled. Nothing can spoil it. Right? You think about an inheritance maybe that was given, a, a house or something of that nature. That house is going to break down. Any inheritance that you can leave to somebody or that you can receive from someone, it is, it, it is corruptible. It can be defiled. It can get mold. It can break down. It can get infested with termites. But you know what? This inheritance in heaven, the, none of those things are true. It's not going to spoil. It's not going to go bad. Do you see how he's, he's, he's painting this picture of, hey, nothing can touch what God has given you. That's what he's trying to get across to us. He says, that, he says that it's incorruptible, it's undefiled, it fades not away, it can't wear out, it can't grow old. That's one of the things that's amazing about heaven is that this, is, this just breaks our mind. If we think about this for too long, it'll probably just drive us crazy. What does it mean? What does eternity mean? Of course, it, it, we know it's forever, right? It's everlasting. We have all these words to describe eternity. But the thing that is, is amazing is that it's almost like there, time does not exist, which is totally foreign to us, right? Because every one of us, whether it's on your phone or on your wrist or on the back wall, we got a time, right? And we get, we're going to be done in the next 22 minutes. We got time. We live in the bubble of time. But one day we're going to step outside of time into a place where there is no time, that's weird, right? I don't know how else to put it. It's strange to think about that. But what he says is, listen, this thing, it will not fade. Because even in this world, the things that seem to be most enduring, they do fade. Studying history is very, is very interesting because you find that the empires, they rise and then they fall, all right? Kings, they come and they go. World leaders, they, they rise up and then they're taken down. All of these things, they, everything in this world is, Im, is uh, impermeable. I don't know if that's the right word. It's not permanent. It's not going to stay. But in heaven, that is not going to fade. It's not going to fall. There's not going to be a fall of heaven in a bajillion years. It's eternity. That's incredible, is it not? Now, what, why, why are we going through all this? Because this may sound very simple. It may sound very common sense, like we know this. But what we have to do is we have to allow this truth that God has laid out for us to sink down into our hearts and to sink into our minds because that will change the way that we look at things. And unfortunately, even in my own life, I look and say, okay, where does that attitude come from? Where does that fear come from? Where does this turmoil come from? I tell you, I, in this last week, I said, oh, I'm just going to take a break from being on Facebook. We're still going to be on Facebook for work, post stuff on for the church and stuff like that. But personally, I'm done scrolling Facebook for a little while because you know what? It's a mess. And everybody's talking about how it's a mess and there's a lot of bad stuff happening. And that's a, there's like 90% that and 10% praise Jesus. Maybe, okay, maybe 5% praise Jesus. I don't know how much percentage is, but it's not much. And I'm looking and saying, where, do these, where does this, this anxiety come from? Where does this fear come from? Where does this frustration come from? It don't come from God. What we need is a healthy dose of truth that would enable us to think right, to feel right, to deal with the heaviness that we face, because Peter's even going to acknowledge for a time, for a season, we are going to face heaviness. But you know what? This truth is going to enable us to rejoice. And that leads us into the next part. When we get down to verse, uh, to verse number uh, five, well, we got to finish five, and then we'll, I want to get to six. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. It's almost like Peter saying, listen, this inheritance, God's taking care of that. God has reserved that in heaven. And you know what? You, God's going to take care of you too. Both sides, right now and for all of eternity, God's got it covered. We get down to verse number six. And verse number six says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold temptations. That's one of those verses that doesn't really fit together, does it? You're going to greatly rejoice, even though for a season, we are in heaviness through manifold temptations. How do those things go together? Well, you're not going to have great rejoicing 
unless you look back to verse 3, 4, and 5, where he says, you have a living hope. Because friends, he's given us a living hope, and that living hope, your next point is that that living hope produces great joy. It produces great joy in our lives, even in the presence of heaviness and pain and trials and temptations and all the problems that go with life. This, uh, this living hope produces great rejoicing. And the thing that I'm challenged with as I'm studying this is, okay, so where is greatly rejoice in Bo's life? On a day-to-day basis, on a week-to-week basis, does greatly rejoice show up? How often does it show up? And if I can be honest, there's, uh, there's not a lot of days where greatly rejoice shows up. But you know when it does show up? It shows up when I've spent good time walking with God. It shows up when we're worshiping together. It shows up when we're singing praise to His name. That's when greatly rejoice shows up. It doesn't show up in many other places, in many other things that happen throughout the week. But as we are walking with God, as we are thinking on the, the things of God and on the truths of God, and we are allowing our hearts and our minds to be shaped by what's found in the Scriptures, greatly rejoice shows up more and more and more. Even though we are facing heaviness. We are facing, what, is he, what does he say in that verse? Manifold temptations. It just means many temptations, all kinds of different problems, all kinds of different pressures. All of these things are coming upon us, but you know what? Right now, we rejoice in the fact that he's given us living hope because we know that this is not the end. We know that the best is yet to come. We know that he has an inheritance for us, and we know that even in all these things that we're facing, it is going to mature our faith. That's what's going to happen in this next bit. He's going to say, we, even though we are in these temptations, it's going to mature our faith. Look there with me very closely. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There's a few parts I want to point out to you. One of the things that he, he starts off with, he says, <laughs> this is strange, though now for a season, if need be, think about those words for a second, if need be. It's almost like saying that, that this is a necessary time, which we would say, no, I'll trade this for anything else. I'll trade COVID for anything else. I'll trade the problems of our world for anything else. But he says, no, you're in a season of heaviness, of manifold temptations, if need be. We're not going to get out of this, friends, but we can go through it and look at what it does when we get down to verse number seven, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise, unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He says this, this trying, this testing of your faith, this proving of your faith is, go, is, is valuable. It's something that's even more valuable than the best gold that you can buy. There's a lot of things that were written about how they would refine gold and they'd take out the impurities and they'd do all of these things. And of course, at that time, they didn't have the processes that we had to, where, hey, let's just go down to Walmart. Let's buy some gold. <laughs> That's not how it works. You go mine it. There's a very specific person that you go to who refines it and they know how to do it and they have the tools to do it. And it's not as abundant as it might be today. And he says, listen, that is valuable. Refined gold is, war- is something that people find value in. But you know what? The, t- the proving of your faith, the testing of your faith, that's even more valuable. We don't like to think about that way, right? Because we could say, okay, it, 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 may, it may be more valuable, but it's not as exciting <laughs> as gold, right? I'd rather go have a brick of gold than have my faith tested and tried. Amen? Okay. I'll be honest, there's days when it's like, hey, that brick of gold, that would be real nice. God, can I get out of this trial? Can I get out of this testing? And God, can you just pour out some gold coins into my wallet? But God says, no, because the the trying of your faith, the maturing of your faith, that is far more valuable than anything that this world has to offer. And let me give you the reasons why. 
He says that it might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. In the future, when Jesus comes back, this is something that I don't know if I have the words to explain or to express, but the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes back, in our lives, through our lives, there's going to be praise and honor and glory that's just going to burst out of them. I don't, I don't understand how that works. I don't know what it looks like. But that's what the Bible tells us. That this refined, matured, tested faith is going to lead to incredible praise and worship and glory of God. Think about the most exciting church service you've ever been. You're worshiping, you're singing, there's preaching, and man, it's just like amazing. It's going to be a billion times better than that. Right now, we only get a glimpse of what praise means. We only get a glimpse of the honor of God being displayed. We only get a glimpse at the glory of Jesus Christ being shown throughout the earth. But then it's going to be incredible. In some, in, in some way, we get to be involved in that because Jesus has he's worked in our lives. He's matured us. He's purified our faith. He, he's strengthened us. And somehow we're going to be involved in, in seeing that happen. Praise God for that. But there's another part of it that's, that's for now. Look at the next verse, verse number eight. He says th- th- it's, it's for the future, but it's also for, for now because now as our faith is matured and as our faith is tried in that valuable, precious process is being, being done in our lives. Look what it says. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. He says, listen, friends, Peter, the writer, he says, I've seen Jesus, right? I've walked with Jesus. I saw him as he was re- after he was resurrected. But you know what? You haven't. But the fact that you haven't, you haven't seen him, but you still believe him, that's faith. And you know what that does? As God matures this faith and as he proves this faith, it leads to incredible, unspeakable joy in our lives. Look at that. He says, having not seen, you love him. Do you love Jesus? It's not because you've seen him. It's because we've heard of him through the word of God, through the testimony of his people, but we love him. And there's this, there's something about loving somebody that even though you've not met them, you know that they're real. You know that they've done a work in your heart. They know that you know that they've changed your life. That's a sweet, precious love that is unlike anything else in this world. And he says, listen, even though you've not seen him, you love him, and what do you do? You rejoice. Look at that verse with me. Do you see the rejoicing in here? He says, yeah, there's trials, yeah, there's testing, but you rejoice in what God has done, that he's given us living hope, and you rejoice in this love of Jesus Christ. And what kind of joy is that? Joy unspeakable. We can try to express it in a song, but it won't come out. We can try to write it down in a poem, but it won't compare to what's going on on the inside that the Holy Spirit has done in our lives. Doesn't that change the now? When we get a hold of what God has done of this living hope, it changes the future, yes, but it changes the now as well. Friend, is there unspeakable joy in your life? And if you're looking saying, my joy is running low, perhaps what you need is exactly what First Peter offers. It's a look at the living hope. It's a look at the internal inheritance. It's a look at what God has done. It's it's pulling back the curtain and saying, listen, I want you to see what God is doing in your life. You may not see it, but you can know it and you can rejoice with joy unspeakable. That would change our lives. That should change our lives. But unfortunately, we overlook the simple things uh, of, of following Jesus, of trusting him, of, of, of asking ourselves the question, do I truly believe this? That's one of the things that I've been challenged with. Do I really believe this? Because if we believe the scriptures, if we believe what is said here, it, it doesn't it look like that it would change the atmosphere of our hearts and lives? I think it would. I think it would. This is a call back to the simple foundational truths And we get down to the very end and he says, hey, he's given us this living hope. He's made joy possible. And then when you get down to verse number 10, he reminds us of something very special. You have a unique blessing from God that so many saints of the Old Testament, they never got to experience. You have something incredibly special. 
And it's what is expressed in John 20, 29, where Jesus said, Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. And when you get down to the last few verses there, verse number 10, it says this salvation that we're talking about, this hope that we're talking about, look look at this, look at this. "Of, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. I'm not sure if I'm going to phrase this the right way, but you have a leg up on David. You have a leg up on Jeremiah. You have a leg up on Samuel. You have a leg up on every single person you would read about in the Old Testament. Because they wanted to know, they desperately wanted to find out what God was saying when he talked about the suffering Savior, when he talked about the ruling Savior. They wanted to understand it, but they couldn't fully get the picture. Do you see what it said there in verse number 10? They were looking for it. They were studying about it. They were asking God, saying, God, who is this Savior? Who is this one that's going to come? How is it going to work? But you know what? They prophesied about it. They told us about the grace that should come. They searched for it. But look at verse number 12. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. There's a couple things in that verse. It was revealed to them that Jesus would suffer. They didn't know his name was Jesus. They knew that he was going to suffer. They knew that he was going to reign, but they didn't know the whole picture. But what they did is they were faithful to God to write those things down, to record them so that we could have them, so that we could study the Bible. Friends, you have something in the word of God that that so many saints down through history never had and would have loved to have. They would have given anything to have. You have that. You enjoy the salvation that they looked and they said, hey, I, I, I want to know about this thing, but I don't get how it works. But they ministered it to us. And did you see that last phrase? This should be one of those just mind-blowing phrases in the Bible or, or messages in the Bible. Which things the angels desire to look into. you. The angels don't even experience what we experience in salvation. They don't know what it's like to be redeemed. They don't know what it's like to experience God's grace. They don't know what it's like to experience mercy. They don't know what it's like to to have this living hope that we have that produces unspeakable joy because they're there at the throne. And they want to look down and they are looking down and watching and saying, hey, I want to see what's going on with that because that looks pretty amazing. But unfortunately, we look up and say, man, I wish I was there. That looks pretty amazing. But they look down and say, no, that God has done something incredible in his creation. And we overlook it all day long. You've been given a unique blessing. God has given you something special. God has given you a living hope. And we might look and say, well, yeah, I know about that. That is old hat. Man, when the gospel becomes old hat to us, what in the world are we doing? The gospel is the whole thing. It's, it, 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 it takes us from salvation, it takes us into eternity. The living hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Friend, we're, we're, we're going to come down and we're going to have a, a slight time of invitation. We've got five minutes and we're going to close out. Friend, do you see all that God's provided for you? Do you really see it? Not eyes, but eyes of faith. Do you grasp it? I think it's very instructive that the, the Bible told us to taste and see. What, how's that go? Taste and see that the Lord is good. There is to be an experience within our hearts and lives and our souls of the goodness and mercy of God. Friends, you're struggling this week. You're frustrated. You're, you're down. You're worried. Things, are, things just look bad every place you turn. Well, maybe it's time to turn up, time to look up, time to look back into the Word of God, time to be reminded of the living hope, and time to allow that truth to permeate our hearts and lives. Would you bow with me? Father, we come to you this morning, and God, we ask you to help us. Lord, the, 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 the way that we walk through this world should be shaped by faith 
in Jesus Christ, by the, the living hope that you've given us. And God, I pray that you'd forgive us for getting our eyes off of you, for getting our, our attention turned to other places, for spending so much time and so much energy worrying about the things that are in your hands. God, forgive us. God, we come to you and we ask your, 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 your help to understand the things that we, we look into your word and we see them and in and, and some days it feels like a very fuzzy picture. God, help us to get a clear view of the, the love, the mercy, the grace that you've shown us. Help us to know the power of the resurrection. The fact that since you live, we shall live also. That there is hope after this life. That there is eternity. That we are kept by the power of God. That nothing can separate us from your love. God, may those things become very, very real in our lives. Father, I think sometimes we need to shut out the noise. We need to shut out the noise of this world and get in tune with the, the still, small voice of the Holy Spirit as you're instructing us, as you're teaching us, as you're comforting us, as you're convicting us, as you're leading us, you're guiding us. God, I thank you that you don't overlook the what it is to, to be mankind, to be, to be human, that we struggle, that there's heaviness, that there's weight, there's burdens. God, the amazing thing is that we have a great high priest. God, you walked through Jesus, you walked through this life. You know what it's like to be tempted. You never sinned, thank you for that, but you know what it's like to be tempted. You know what it's like to suffer. God, you can sympathize with us, and we thank you for that. Thank you for your word that directs us back to you, back to your heart, back to your truth. God, I pray for your people that you would allow them, you would enable them to be settled and still and calm in the fact that you love them, that you've forgiven us, that you've shown us your mercy, that you've saved us, that you've given us living hope. God, I pray you transform our hearts and minds through your word that we'd live from a perspective as pilgrims, as strangers, as citizens of heaven. And that would form and shape our lives. It would shape our attitudes. It would shape our thoughts, shape our feelings. God, we yield to you this morning. We allow you to work in our hearts and lives. Praise things in Jesus' name. Amen.